So good to see each and every one of you this morning. And as we are here around this very visible cross this morning, it reminds us again that it is at the cross our salvation was paid for with the very blood of the Lord Jesus. But it was at the grave, that tomb, bursting forth three days later that he demonstrates all the authority and proof of what he said. He is who he said he is. He is life, he is hope, he is the new creation for each one of us. And as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday, as you and I are here together, we praise God that he has given us not just a church to be a part of, but a savior to be in. Let's just open in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you again. We thank you that you have called us to yourself and you have called us to your son. You have called us this morning, not only to remember the cross and what it means, but that we remember that empty tomb, but more importantly, the person who emerged from that empty tomb. If we just went around looking at empty tombs, we'd be men most miserable, but we have that promise. The Lord Jesus himself said, I am with you. So Lord, please come amongst us right now. And as you come amongst us, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that perhaps someone listening this morning or watching this morning will hear this message. Oh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you might descend upon the bones and make them live. And we give you our thanks for your Son, our Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it doesn't seem that long ago that we were celebrating on Good Friday the cross that is in front of me, but in, in front of you as well. And some of the hymn writers say, I take my place shielded by the cross. And certainly each one of us does so. Following the Good Friday service, Becky and I had an opportunity to drive down to the little uh, community hall in Shillington. As you know, we meet there usually Sunday afternoons and for the next four weeks, it'll, it too will have some changes. Um, in fact, it's uh, going on online only. So uh, through no, no I des desire of ours, but uh, the, that's the uh, consensus of those who are, are running the, uh, the uh, committee that runs the hall. And uh, so while we were down there, we decided with this four week shutdown, starting the next day would be a good opportunity to pick up some Chinese food. <laughs> um, Maybe you're, you're like myself, you enjoy a good feed of Chinese food. We, we know the folks that run the restaurant. And so uh, we were happy to visit with them a few moments. They, happy to, they reported that they're, as they said, holding their own. It's a tough time for those who are in small businesses, restaurants and otherwise. And perhaps you could keep those folks in prior as well. It's an it's extremely tough, tough time. Following the meal, we were presented with some extra fortune cookies. And I, I like fortune cookies. Uh, not that I believe there's anything special about uh, opening a, a cracker and pulling out a little message. Actually, I like the taste of the cookies. <laughs> um, but as far as, uh, as what's inside with the little message, um, I guess uh, my conviction about the sovereignty of God is that he, he controls everything. It was every lot's cast in the lap, but this every decision is from the Lord. So uh, I, I'm looking at this little message and well, <laughs> it seemed to kind of appropriate. It said this, now is a good time for a bit of solitude. And I'm saying, uh, okay, that's a bit of a sense of humor God has here, go figure. This past uh, Thursday, our John's Gospel chapter five study uh, looked at the man at, that was at the pool. And what's the first thing that Jesus says to this man who's been lying there for 38 years? Do 
you want to get well? <laughs> Duh. You know, it's kind of like one of those questions, huh? It's like somebody coming up and saying, you want to win a million dollars or you want to, you know, you want to be rich, you know, of course. <laughs> but uh, I think he does this because he wants to get to the heart of who this man is. This morning, he wants to get to the heart of who you are. See, it, we're here not just to uh, enjoy each other's company, the presence of the Lord, the wonderful hymns and singing that we had earlier. Um, I hope you guys have another hymn for us at the end. Good, excellent. Uh, we were, we're so blessed in so many ways, aren't we? We can be the negative Nelly. Yeah. I hope Nelly's not listening right now. Uh, <laughs> but we can be the negative Nelly and just look at all the bad things that are going on. Or we can remember, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So how, how about this? Do you want a million dollars? Well, I suppose the person would normally say yes. But let me tell you the story very briefly of Frayn Selek, a Croatian music teacher. He won a million dollars. Yes, indeed he did. On uh, the date of the lottery was uh, 2003, he won $1.1 million. Would you like to be that gentleman? Let me tell you about this gentleman, Frame. He, uh, in 1962, when he was 32 years old, uh, he was involved in a train crash. No fault of his own, he just happened to be in it. It crashed into the icy river that he was, tra was traveling over, killing 17 passengers. He was lucky, he was pulled out by someone else and suffered only a broken arm and mild hypothermia. The next year, 1963, Frayn, now this is the guy who won a million dollars, so you're, you have to follow this closely. If you want the million dollars, you gotta follow the life of the person that got the million dollars. The next year, 63, his mother was ill, so he decided to fly to visit her. Even though the flight was crowded, they managed to squeeze him in at the very back of the, the bus, back of the plane. And at midway through the flight, plane lost its engines, Cabin pressure drops, and Frayne was blown out the back door of the of the plane, falling, of course, with, without a parachute. There were there were 19 people on board who were killed in this crash. Frayne was not one of them. He landed in a haystack. In 1966, he was riding a bus, skidded off the road, crashed into the river, drowning all four drowning four passengers. He swam to shore, survived only with some minor bruises. Frey decided to travel mostly by car from then on. Public transport wasn't suiting him too well. I don't know why. But in 1970, his car caught fire while driving. He was able to jump out of the moving vehicle just in time seconds before the fuel tank exploded. Three years later, with another car, <laughs> He, the fuel pump of the car broke, causing the engine fire to shoot out of its exhaust vents. Well, his hair was completely fried off in the incident, but he survived this near-death accident as well. In 1995, he was hit head-on by a bus while trying to uh, get away from his car. Uh, 1996, to avoid a head-on collision with another bus or another truck driving in the mountains of Croatia, his car crashed across the guardrail, fell 300 feet. He managed to jump at the last minute and grab hold to a tree on the side of the, the mountain. Seven deadly accidents. But if you were to know each one of them was going to, you were going to survive it, I guess you could say, well, I'd, I'd push on. He bought two houses with his million dollars and a boat, eventually gave all his money away to his friends and lived in, in, uh, in, in pretty modest living for the rest of his life. I believe he's still alive if I understand correctly. So the question is, is this getting well, having a million dollars? I think you and I would know that it's not about the money. The prosperity gospel is not from the Bible. 
but rather the blessings of the Lord is about life and peace and happiness and forgiveness of our sin. And so let's look at the passage in front of us, Matthew 28. There are four, actually five accounts of the resurrection, if you include Acts as an account. And Matthew's account puts it this way. Now, most of us would probably say, why we just study one? Why don't we just kind of synthesize them all together? And uh, probably because so far it's, it's a bit of a challenge to put them all together. And so let's just stay with Matthew's account. It says at the late hours, verse one, following the Sabbath, as it began to grow light on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to consider the tomb. And behold, there began a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended out of heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the opening, sat down on it. His appearance was like lightning and his garments were white as snow. And for fear of them, the guards convulsed and became just like dead corpses. This is how it starts. The details of the miracle begins with these women. It's the first day of the week, Sunday morning. After all, they're working on a calendar that's different from yours and mine. You see, we kind of, even though we call Sunday the first day of the week, our weekends sort of dictate that Sunday is actually the last day of the week, don't we? So the Jewish calendar is a little bit different. Their Jewish calendar also starts at a different time. We think of a day ending at midnight, you know, 1201, it's just the start of a new day. But in fact, the, for the Jewish mind, the beginning of the next day actually was in the evening of the previous day. I know that sounds a little confusing, but that's the way they thought. Genesis 1.5, it says, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and morning were the first day. And because the word evening is first, they take their day as starting from the evening of the previous day to the following sundown. So how was it then that Jesus said he'd be dead for three days and rise? It's not 72 hours if you do the math. It's not, but it's three legal days. Yes, he died approximately at three o'clock on, on a Friday afternoon, and he rose early Sunday morning. Friday counts as one day, Saturday counts as two days, and Sunday the morning counts as the third day. It's three legal days. It's not three 24-hour days, as you and I might think. So. He shared that, that thought many times before he died. Why did he do that? Because he wanted people to know death was not the end. God wants you to know today, death is not your end. When we have someone here in a coffin or the ashes in an urn, we can literally say that you see right there that person that you once saw moving and now is still and silent is more alive than they ever were on this side of eternity. That's the first thing we can remember. Death is very, very real, but it's not the end. It's just the beginning. As people say, some look at death as a sundown, and others look at it as a sunrise. For the Christian, it's a sunrise. When Jesus was presented to the people at noon and was told by, the, by Pilate, behold your king, he then very quickly moves over to the, the side of the cross where he's impaled on that cross. And it says in Matthew's account that from Noon to 3 p.m., there was no light. I know that I've watched, and you have too, many movies of the crucifixion. And most of them, I think maybe one has a got it right, where it's dark. Most of them, the lighting is really good. And for photography, you need good lighting. But that's not accurate. It was dark. There were torches. There were people standing around barely able to see what was going on. 
it was dark for three hours. That's no eclipse, by the way. Any of us who've watched an eclipse know it only happens for a few minutes. This was a supernatural darkness. It's, that's a question you can ask the Lord how he did that or what he did to make that, if you want, when you get to glory. I simply say, his word says it, I believe it, that settles it. That's the attitude of the believing heart when it comes to the word of God. Nothing wrong with having questions, but let God be God. And when he says something, he means it. He says, all you who believe in Jesus can be born again, born anew, born from above and live forever. And so the message of the cross and the message of the resurrection is that we're not going to just be in a temporal 60, 70, 80, 90, even 100 years. We are eternal beings meant to be with God forever. There was a tomb. And if you don't have them in your library, there are three books I would hardly recommend, along with your Bible, to have in your library. The first was written by Frank Morrison called Who Moved the Stone? He wrote the book to create the evidence for the resurrection. He didn't, he didn't go in thinking that was the way it was going to be, but it certainly came out that way. The Case for Christ, written by Lee Strobel, is another movie and another book, and well worth it. And then the third one, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDonald. Why are these so important? Why am I stressing these books? Because the resurrection is provable, factual, historical, accurate, and truthful. We are not believing a fable. We are not believing a fairy table tale. We are not believing a myth. We are not believing in our imaginations. We are believing in the one who really came into this world and really died upon a cross. And yes, he really arose from the dead. And then he promises all who believe in me will have new life. The guards, their response was fear shaking like dead corpses. I understand that there are some medical conditions that the anxiety and fear is so intense that it causes a temporary paralysis. But the Bible says we are all in that position without faith in Christ. Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 5, but you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. And so before Christ, we're all in that position. Someone hearing my voice this morning and says, I'm a, but I'm a religious person. I do my penance. I bow. I, I pay my tithes to the church. I, I, I tend faithfully. And, and the Lord says, as much as those are good, it's not enough. For whoso commits one sin, breaks the law in one point, James says, it is complete. That's all it takes, one sin and what one of us hasn't sinned already just coming here this morning what one of us hasn't had multitudes of sin the joy of the resurrection is it's not about us it's about him and when we get to the point where we call out to him i can't do this the ten commandments are too hard and he says good I, oh i'm so blessed that you finally get it you need to trust in my substitutionary death. And you go, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Ah, but I'm alive. I'm here standing right beside you right now. And I'm here to tell you, I am alive. And I want in your heart. And that's why to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you hear him? Do you hear his voice knocking and saying, I want in, you're holding back on me. You're refusing to trust me completely with your life. You know, it's either you trust him in this life or you're gonna stand before him in the next life saying, I wish I had. There's only two roads and there's only one way and that way is the Lord Jesus. The discussion of the angel is from verses five through verse eight. 
And the angel began to speak to them and said to the women, do not be afraid. I perceive you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the space where the Lord was stretched out. Go travel quickly. Tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. And indeed, he's going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I've told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to announce this to his disciples. Do not be afraid. Do you notice that's the first statement? Faith and fear cannot coexist. Let me repeat that. If you are constantly living in fear, you are not living in faith. And in this day and age where fear is paramount and it's been promoted um, so much in this world we're living in, I'm here to remind you as God's messenger today that faith in the Lord Jesus, not in yourself, not in your church, not in your works, but in the risen Christ, the one who well, lovingly comes alongside of us when we least expect it. Gives us a little nudge and says, hey, by the way, have you thought of this? Or the one who says to us, there's a different way and I'm ready to help you when you're ready to hear me. Do not be afraid. The women, well, they, it was still dark. It was early in the morning. I'm sure they must have looked around and said, what can we do? We're just women. We, we have no defense, no strength. We're in danger. There's Roman soldiers everywhere. We could just hunker down. We could just stay, so, stay home, stay safe, stay calm. But he wants us to go. He wants us to go. He wanted them to go. And it was the women who went. And yes, the women were the first witnesses of the resurrection. They said, he is risen, just as he said in John 2, 19 and Mark 8, 31, he had said that. And he is alive. And so what was the message that they were to tell? He is risen. Jesus is risen. That is our primary message today. I think we've got it all wrong in evangelism. We need to tell people that Jesus is alive. That's the primary good news. And they went out quickly to announce what? He is risen. They got it. Three simple words, not hard. As they go, they meet the Lord Jesus himself. In verses 9 and 10, it says, As they went to the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Now, some translations say hail. Some translations say greetings. But the Greek says, rejoice. Wow, what a great reading from the Lord. They had been sorrowing and grieving. They had seen the, 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 the Messiah. They had seen the Christ. They had seen the one who had healed, impaled on the cross. And they were sad that it was all over in their minds. One of the greatest proofs of the resurrection is the response of the disciples and the, earth and the women. They didn't expect a resurrection. What organization that seeks to defraud everybody and, and grow a, a movement does so with people who don't believe God's organization because he works with uh, real people who have real doubts. Somebody listening today may have real doubts. No problems. Thomas had real doubts. He says, look, you guys have seen the risen Christ. I know what I see, and it's not the risen Christ. And I see you guys, and you guys look wild. You guys look crazy people. You know, There's a lot of crazy people out here in this world, and you look like one of them. And Thomas says, show me. Show me the marks in his hands. Show me the, the, the point of the... Marks in his, in his feet. Show me these things and I'll believe. And Jesus does that. And there's Thomas. He's fallen on his knees. My Lord and my God. And that's what Jesus wants from each one of us. To realize he is our Lord and our God. They went. They met Jesus. They worshiped and hugged his feet. But he says, don't be afraid. Again, that Fear can so paralyze us from serving. Go and announce to my brothers and tell them to leave for Galilee. And there they shall see me. His greeting was rejoice. 
His announcement was, tell them I'm alive. In part D, we have the deception of the guards in verses 11 through 15. We won't give them too much time this morning. We know the story. They were bribed. Money can do a lot of things, but what it can't do is make a person who is dead alive. All it can do is fabricate stories about, false stories about this. And so they said, we'll take the money and we'll do as you instructed. And the saying was commonly reported among the Jews to this day. But why does it not ring with truth? Remember, the same people who denied Peter and the other disciples, what did they do after the resurrection? They boldly proclaim, he is alive. You know, uh, the real test of whether you've been born again is do you really want to witness to people? When I got saved as a 17 year old, really saved, not just phony saved. There's a lot of phony saved people around. You know, they've, they've got the words, they've got the, the attitude that sometimes, they've got their, their, uh, um, their persona, but what they don't have is genuine salvation. They don't have Jesus because he's saying, hey, wait a minute. You don't want me. I'm not coming in. I'm too much of a gentleman. I'm not coming in. These guards took the bribe, but it doesn't ring with truth. And the same is true for many people in the church today. They claim they know Jesus, and he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. The final part is verses 16 to 20 in Matthew's account. And it, did you catch that? He gets right into the something that happens weeks later. And when they fall down uh, and, and prostrate themselves and worship in verse 17, Jesus comes to them and says, all authority has been given in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to practice and guard everything I've commanded you and see I'm with you always, even to the consummation of the ages. You know, it doesn't say go and if the authorities will let you in, uh, uh, that's good. But if they don't let you in, just stay. No, he says, go out into all the world. The good news of the gospel is that we are not bound by any human authority when it comes to evangelism. Amen? Yeah. We are bound by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And while we be subject to human authority, the human authority that we are subject to is that Jesus, that human authority. And when he says, go, we go. Teach them all things, not just some things. That's the challenge of the church. You know, in every church, every church group teaches an evidence on certain things and on other things not so. We need to teach all things. And that's the joy of growing as a Christian. And he says, I'm with you always. I am always with you. Has he been with you this morning? Wow, he has, he's been here. He's been touching our hearts. He's been with us in the music. He's been with us in the Lord's Supper. He's been with us when we were sleeping and we didn't acknowledge him. And he still wants to be with us. But are you with him? John 15 says this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall have joy. They rejoice, they were told to rejoice. May we go forth this day rejoicing that the Lord Jesus has arisen and he's risen in our hearts. You see, it's not just about him going back up to heaven. He still wants to come in to our lives and he's desiring it even today. May there be some who are here or there or otherwhere that, G that Jesus gets to have first place in their hearts. May God bless you. We'll call up the music team at this time.